Santiago, the Chilean capital. Hugo Figueroa, a first-year medical resident, is making morning rounds. A few blocks away at a local high school, 11th grader Christian Anfossi and his classmates are learning how to set up their own business with the help of some unconventional teachers. And several hundred kilometers to the south, in a three-room schoolhouse, 8th grader Veronica Montero is learning history and grammar with the aid of computers linked to the most prestigious universities in the country. Veronica, Hugo, and Christian have something in common. They are all poor students benefiting from educational opportunities that their parents, and certainly their grandparents, never had. Veronica's grandfather, 75-year-old Esteban Milevillo, never made it beyond first grade. I knew of only one school. We had to walk a mile each way. The roads were bad, all muddy. I'm luckier than they were. They went as far as they could. I'll go as far as I can. I'm already beating them because they never reached eighth grade. In my parents' circle, no one even thought about going to college. I'm the first of my whole extended family to go to the university and become a professional. What are Chileans doing to create better opportunities for their children? Chile is carrying out experiments, trying out new and important experiences, and so from that point of view, we are beginning to look much like an educational laboratory. Perhaps one of Chile's peculiarities, or perhaps one of its uh, virtues, is that of being very sensitive to good ideas and being willing to apply them as models in order to transform the country. Beginning in 1980 and up to the present time, Chile has carried out a series of radical and sometimes controversial reforms to improve the quality of education and make it more accessible to all students, even the poorest in the country. In this edition of Global Links, we'll examine the impact of these reforms on Chile's educational system, what worked, what didn't, and what still needs to be accomplished. Chile's interest and willingness to innovate in education goes back a long way in its history. It was well over a hundred years ago, back in 1879, that the government made the bold decision to establish free education for all Chileans, boys as well as girls. This totally transformed the social fabric of the nation by making massive education available in ways that even today can be considered extraordinary. As school enrollment grew from 10,000 in 1850 to 350,000 in 1920, Nobel Prize winning poets such as Pablo Neruda and Chile's first female physicians and lawyers emerged from a newly born middle class. In the 1960s, the government built thousands of schools across the country. In the following decade, almost a million new students entered primary school. However, in the push to build so many schools, the government spread its resources too thinly, and as a result, quality suffered. Then, in 1973, General Augusto Pinochet came into power through a military coup. The new leader and his economic advisors believed the government should intervene as little as possible in the economy and in the delivery of social services. High on Pinochet's list of reforms was Chile's educational system, which at the time was entirely controlled by the central government. Long considered one of the best educational systems in Latin America, the quality of Chilean public education had been falling steadily since the 1960s. Many in the country agreed that the time was right for reform. When we come back, we'll take a look at the radical changes introduced by the government in the 1980s and how those changes laid the groundwork for reforms that continue to this day. 
In 1980, Hugo Figueroa was a bright 10-year-old in teacher Jose Vera's fourth grade class. Hugo was always the most brilliant student in his class and also the most compassionate. He not only studied a lot, but also was always willing to help other children. <laughs> Although Hugo's family was poor, he got a good enough education to make it through medical school with the help of loans and scholarships. When the 1980s reforms were first introduced to the Chilean educational system, Hugo's public school, like thousands of others across the country, was controlled and managed by the Ministry of Education, a system many considered inefficient. All the decisions were made by the Ministry of Education, but the Ministry is far removed from the people. When there were problems in a community, when a chalkboard needed replacement, or there was a broken window, they had to write to the ministry. It would take months before a response was received. In order to improve quality in public schools like Hugo's, the government decided to radically reform the system. In the 80s, Chile decentralized its educational system, transferring administration of schools from the Ministry of Education to 330 municipalities. Jose Vera and thousands of other teachers who up till now had been employed by the state became municipal employees. The government also promoted privatizing education by encouraging the creation of publicly financed private schools. Both public and private schools began having to compete for students and government subsidies. A voucher system was established based on students' average attendance for free private schools as well as public schools. The voucher system had never been attempted before on such a widespread scale anywhere in the world. The idea was that parents and students could choose which public or subsidized private school they wished to attend, and the government would then pay the schools according to the number of students they attracted. A national standardized test called the SIMSE was set up to measure students' performance. This allowed parents to pick schools with the best test results. The new system created healthy competition by allowing a comparison between public schools and private subsidized schools. Given a choice, many parents opted for private subsidized primary schools, which increased by more than 60 percent between 1981 and 1986. During this period, overall enrollment in primary schools continued to be near universal, while secondary school enrollment rose by almost 30 percent and pre-primary by 65 percent. The reforms also transformed higher education. Chile's public universities would no longer be free. The government decided students who could afford it should pay tuition. Those who couldn't were given access to loans and scholarships so that no needy student was turned away. The idea was that by getting parents to pay for higher education, the government would be able to free up more of its resources on improving the quality of education at the primary level and expand secondary and higher education opportunities for poor students. The government also encouraged the creation of private universities, which increased from two to over 40 within a decade. As a result, between 1980 and 1987, the number of students enrolled in higher education rose by over 50 percent. But not all Chileans were happy with the reforms. Many middle-class parents resented being charged tuition for higher education, and critics said increased enrollment at the lower level did not necessarily lead to a better quality education. If you compare SIMSE test results at the beginning of the 80s with results from the 90s, there is not one bit of difference between the beginning and the end of the decade as far as learning results go, which is the only valid test for measuring educational quality. The reforms were further complicated by unforeseen events. A major downturn in the economy starting in 1982 temporarily stalled the educational reforms and created severe economic hardship for most Chileans. It brought about a terrible social situation and enormous unemployment. Because of the crisis, the value of vouchers was frozen. School budgets were cut. 
Many teachers were fired or had to accept lower salaries. Public schools were the hardest hit by the crisis. 300 teachers were fired in this municipality alone. On losing such top quality teachers, parents began to transfer their children from municipal schools to private subsidized schools. Enrollment went down. With the 90s came a return to democracy. The severe economic crisis which had stalled educational reform had ended by 1987. Despite intense political pressure to go back to a centralized educational system, new democratically elected governments decided to uphold the key elements of the 80s reforms and even take them one step further. We want to give communities the right to participate in schools and schools the power to manage their own resources and design better teaching methods and curricula. Decentralization is an inevitable process in this country in every field, and also in education. It means placing trust in people, in teachers, students, parent associations, in school corporations, so that as a result, all of us can grow. The Fleming School is an example of this approach. In 1995, backed by the mayor of the Las Condes municipality, teachers at the Fleming School formed a corporation and took over school management. Most teachers here find it a real challenge to show that we're capable of managing the school, not only financially, but also on a curricular level. Kids are more committed, feel more a part of the school. Parents are happier with the school, too. Today, Chile is experimenting with a wide range of pilot programs like the Fleming School to change the way schools are run and to improve teaching methods and curricula. At the same time, a national program aimed at improving educational quality is bringing computers, audiovisual equipment, libraries and new books and other teaching materials into public schools all across the country. When we come back, a closer look at some of these programs and at how Chile is striving to make education more accessible to even the poorest students in the country. Thirteen-year-old Veronica Montero is a member of the Mapuche tribe, one of Chile's indigenous groups. Veronica lives on the Nirimapu Reservation in one of the most remote areas of the country. Despite this isolation, using a computer, Veronica is able to correspond through the Internet with pen pals all over the country. I've sent letters everywhere, Pucón, Santiago, Punta Arenas. Sometimes I get a reply. When I write to my friend, I tell her about my teachers and how many computers we have. Computers help you understand things better. The image helps clear up what the teacher is saying. Veronica is part of a pilot program launched by the University of La Frontera near the city of Temuco. The project, which has placed computers in hundreds of small rural schools in the area, is now part of a national effort to improve educational quality. They are brilliant. They understand it immediately. They work on their own with hardly any help. We've seen that kids have more creative and diverse ideas. Their reading comprehension improves because they have so much fun writing on the web. But the most noticeable improvement has been their motivation. The web will eventually link all of Chile's 2,000 secondary and 9,000 elementary public schools to 18 universities, which are already providing technical assistance and online training for teachers. <laughs> For years, the Nehuentue school was a typical Chilean rural school, isolated, poor, its students among the neediest in the country. 
Then in 1991, Ne Wen Tue became part of P900, a government program which is trying to bridge the quality gap between rich and poor schools in the country. Results from the SIMSA test showed an enormous distance between schools with poor kids and private schools with upper and middle class kids. It was a difference of almost 40 points. The P900 program is giving additional funding to 10% of Chile's poorest schools to see if this will improve their performance. The results for schools like Neuentue have been impressive. In six years, this small rural school, 800 kilometers south of Santiago, almost doubled its SIMSE test results, bringing it up to par with many publicly funded schools in Santiago. Neuentue and dozens of other pilot programs in rural and urban areas across the country are also experimenting with progressive new curricula and with hands-on teaching methods that incorporate students' real-life experiences into learning. By letting farm kids, Mapuche kids or fishermen's kids talk about what they do in their daily lives, what they're familiar with, we help them express themselves and create a link between student and teacher. So learning becomes easy. Monthly workshops like this, organized by the Ministry of Education, encourage teachers to share new classroom techniques. No es posible. In the world of the future, it's no longer going to be enough for a child to memorize facts because They'll be changing at a rapid speed. He'll have to learn to think, discover and solve problems. So we need to change the way we teach. Changing teaching methods, however, means greater involvement of teachers who are already complaining they are overworked and underpaid. And this is just one of the many problems Chileans say need to be addressed to make their educational system one of the best in the world. When we return, a closer look at some of the challenges Chile's educational system faces as it looks to the future. Omar Riquelme is what Chileans call a taxi teacher. He spends five hours a day on the bus, traveling between different schools, where he teaches a total of 72 hours a week. It's inhuman to work so many hours. You need time to prepare class, to prepare educational material in order to do a good job. But Omar says he has no choice. There's no way he and his family can live on 360 U.S. dollars, the monthly salary he would make teaching at only one school. That amount barely covers bus fare and food for the family. We hardly see each other, only for a little while when he comes home late at night. So we don't get much chance to talk. When we do talk, he's so tired, he just falls asleep. The future of a lot of young people rests on us. If we are not able to teach properly, they're the ones who are going to suffer. In order to complete the reform program, it's crucial that we change the way teachers are paid. So it's more closely tied to performance, and so that teacher salaries reflect the importance of their role in society. If we don't plan a higher level, we'll soon have a hard time finding people willing to be teachers. Chile has been working hard to solve this problem. Recently, the government reached an agreement with teachers to raise their salaries substantially. Another ambitious plan is to lengthen the school day from four to six hours. All these measures aimed at improving educational quality, raising teacher salaries, lengthening the school day, and introducing new programs into schools are costly, but the government says it's committed to investing more in education. In my two years as president, our educational budget has gone up 25 percent. However, we're still far from our goal, reaching 7 percent of the gross national product by the year 2000. 
Recent national prosperity could help the country reach this goal. Chile's economic growth has averaged over 8% in the past 10 years, and Chilean's average income is now about 5,000 U.S. dollars a year. This impressive growth was fueled, in part, by Chile's earlier investments prior to the 1980s in educating its labor force. Continuing to invest in educational quality could help sustain this growth. Meanwhile, the government is once again pushing for private contributions to help pay for educational improvements. The private sector has energy, resources, schools, research centers. They are a part of and should be a part of a national educational effort. Their participation is crucial. The government recently passed legislation allowing both private and public schools to charge tuition. Called shared financing, the new system charges students on a sliding scale while giving needy students scholarships. Charging parents for public education is controversial and has stirred up mixed reactions. This is an extremely dangerous move. We risk having three levels of education, first class, for private school students, second class for students at public schools who are into share financing, and third class for students in tuition-free schools. El apoderado parents have shown a greater interest in their children's education. They're more committed and participate more because they're contributing financially. Under the new rules, poor students like Hugo Figueroa would still be eligible for the government loans and scholarships that helped him make it through medical school. I would never have been able to go to school without the scholarships because this university is the most expensive in the country, and my parents could never have been able to afford it. There are scholarships available for 15% of Chilean students attending university. About 40 to 45 percent can get government loans given through universities. Private companies are also contributing more to education. Christian Anfossi and his classmates at the Aravena Andaur Public School are learning how to set up a factory. The class is taught by Coca-Cola executives. First, you study the market to find out what product is needed. Since winter is a good time for it, we decided to make chocolates. We'll soon market and distribute them. Coca-Cola is doing this because it feels committed to helping the community wherever it is. The Chilean Coca-Cola Foundation has donated over a hundred thousand U.S. dollars to Christian School and is providing scholarships to needy students. But Coca-Cola executives say their contribution is not just charity. They see it as investing in future leaders. The Electrotechnical High School is another example of companies contributing to education. The school, financed by the Chilean National Industrial Association, prepares students for the future job market and places them in high-tech jobs right after graduation. When I come out of here, I'll already have a degree which will help me make a living even if I don't go to college. It's clear that Chilean educational reform is an ongoing process, one requiring constant review, adjustment, and a willingness to change course if necessary. When we return, a final look at what we can learn from the Chilean experience. We began to compare ourselves with the countries that have made profound changes in their educational system in recent years, like the Asian countries, or those with a long educational tradition like Europe or the U.S. We are finding that we are behind, and we have to catch up if we want to be competitive. The Chilean experience shows that bold educational reforms are possible, but that they require certain key elements to succeed. First, a country must be willing to experiment, to try out new ideas and apply them in order to improve its educational system. Chile has a long tradition of doing this from its earliest history, and the results are proving to be positive. 
For example, the country set out to decentralize schools, transferring control from the ministry to 330 municipalities. It also encouraged the creation of publicly financed private schools. This created healthy competition and has given parents the option of choosing schools with the best quality education. The government also mobilized private contributions from parents and companies so it could concentrate its resources on improving the quality of primary education and expanding access to secondary and higher education for the poor. Second, bold educational experiments are possible only if a country is willing to evaluate and make adjustments to policies that are not working. For example, when national test results showed a growing inequity between rich and poor public schools, the government set up a program to give the poorest schools additional funding. Third, reforms require a sustained vision and commitment from leaders and citizens to make changes even in the face of political pressure or economic difficulty. Reforms initiated in 1980 were upheld even in the face of a severe economic crisis and carried one step further by democratically elected governments of the 90s in spite of a radical change in government. Fourth, the Chilean experiment proves that educational reform must be ongoing. The current drive to improve quality and equity is giving birth to exciting new programs to change teaching methods and curricula, incorporating students' own experiences, and emphasizing problem-solving and creative thinking. Chile has grown, Chile has had development. But if we want to turn the corner, give a giant leap, and leave underdevelopment behind, the only way we can do so in the world today is through education and knowledge. Chileans at all levels of society say they agree and are striving to educate themselves and their children. When the kids come home and need to study for a test, we don't send them out to feed the animals. We give them time to learn. I hope that while I leave, I can help them go on and study in Temuco. <laughs>